Well, hello, Internet, and welcome to part three of my PHP security tutorial. Today, I'm going to go back to our more traditional presentation style just for this one time and go over the most vulnerable website security flaws that hackers commonly attack. Now, this is going to be a basic presentation. It's going to become a little bit complicated in some parts, but I kind of dumbed a lot of things down. So if I don't get too specific in this presentation, that's why. In future presentations, don't worry, I'll get much more specific in regards to how sites are attacked and how to better secure them. Specifically, I'm going to go over ways you can defend your website, repeat to you over and over again that nothing sent from the client is ever safe, meaning JavaScript code and so forth and so on, or user input that you think has been secured or cleaned by JavaScript. You can never count on this being true. I'm going to go through some ways that hackers break through user authentication, and by that I just mean user IDs and passwords, and some ways to protect yourself from the client side and authentication attack. And then I'll go briefly over an explanation on some of the other techniques hackers use to break into sites. These are the four main ways you can defend your website through authentication properly, using proper user IDs, passwords, and CAPTCHAs to make sure that you can block automated attacks by properly cleaning all user input through session management and by limiting access and keeping administration tools completely separate from your basic user accounts. You must always clean all messages sent to the server, on the server. Why is that? It's extremely easy to manipulate the client side. And I'm going to give you a couple different ways that this is done. First, the person could go in and download your entire website with an application such as wget, edit the code however they like, and then reload that page they created and attack the server. Now, you can check what is called the refer header, which is a reference to the IP address that sent the page, and this is embedded in the HTTP request. However, this can also be edited. So there truly is no way to actually trust anything sent from the client side. Also, hackers like to use something called an intercepting proxy. What these do is they sit between the browser and the server. So you actually have the client, and then you have the intercepting proxy, and then you have the server. So an intercepting proxy sits between what you think is your safe, secure JavaScript code or whatever else you're using on the client end, because nothing can protect you on the client end, not even Flash or Java, as I'm going to explain here in a minute. So it sits between the client, and it grabs and intercepts all the information before it gets to the server. And it also grabs information from the server before it gets to the client. And programs such as WebScara, Burp, and Paris are used. These are what we call intercepting proxies. And they're extremely easy to set up. So I just want to make it absolutely positive that you understand that variables and hidden values, cookies, anything can easily be seen and edited. And of course, if you use the get method for passing information, it is quite easy to change anything that is passed through the URL. So here I could easily come in and change this value. Encrypted values also might not be safe if they are sent from the client. And here I'm going to give you a sort of real-world example. Let's say, for example, you, cr you create a PHP store, and whenever a person chooses a product that they want to purchase, such as a Sony Stereo, you also pass an encrypted value for the specific price for the Sony Stereo. Let's say, for example, the person might have a discount code or what have you. For any reason, you decide that you must pass the price. However, you think, well, I'll just encrypt that price, and they won't be able to change it wrong. Chances are, if you do encrypt anything in your PHP code, you encrypt everything in precisely the same way. So very easily, somebody could go and find, say, the price for a pack of gum, which they know is going to be considerably less than a Sony Stereo, and then take this encrypted code and place it in the URL just like this. So this is just a brief example of how encrypted values are maybe also not safe if they're coming from the client. And if you're using Java applets or Flash, this is just how simple it is to go in and do precisely the same thing as you do with PHP code, for example. If you have a Java applet, you could just run it through a program called JAD, which will decompile it, and then another program called Jode, which will clean any obfuscated code, which means a lot of times people create Java applets and Flash programs and so forth and so on, and then they run them through what's called an obfuscator, and what it basically does is jumbles up the code. Well, a program like Jode will clean that up for you. And Flash also has programs that do very similar things. 
So how exactly do you protect yourself from potentially damaging information sent from the client? Well, just never transfer anything personal to the client, nor transfer anything that doesn't need to be directly from the client to the server. How we would get around the little problem that we had before in regards to whether you wanted to pass a price, well, first off, if at all possible, just don't pass this, this price so that the person has the opportunity to change it. But if you find the need, you could take a product identification number followed by the price and then encrypt this whole entire value and then separate them. This would help you avoid that issue. Also, you want to avoid showing encrypted and uncrypted versions of exactly the same text so that the hacker would be able to figure out exactly how that text was encrypted. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't try to secure the information on the client because this is often a great trap to figure out whether you are currently being hacked. Let's say that you check that a person in a name field, for example, or for a user ID, only enters up to 12 characters, for example. Well, then, if you are passed on the PHP end or on the server side a password that is higher than 12 characters, chances are very good that the person somehow bypassed your JavaScript checks, and now you're being presented with that same problem again, which should have been disabled on the client end, which would mean you either have a hacker or somebody is trying to access your website with JavaScript disabled. If you decide to err on the side of safety, you would log the IP, close the session, and disable the account. And I'm going to get more into how to do all these different things in later tutorials. You also want to follow very proper cleaning procedures for all data that is sent from the client, from the user. You want to validate the input contains only valid characters and a valid length. And this order is very specific. Then you want to protect against SQL injection. Then you want to verify the user's identity. And then you want to escape the HTML. And the reason why we do it in this order is, let's say, you would encode this caret bracket right here to this format and then come in and delete out all the AND symbols and the semicolons to protect your overall security. You can see here that that's going to create a lot of other additional flaws. So how is authentication attack? Mainly through brute force attacks, but that's definitely not it. And if you think you are being attacked through a brute force attack, you could of course track all your failed logins and lock down that account based off of tracking the IP address. However, this does open you up for another hack, which is called a denial of service attack where the person could simply come in and continually enter wrong password for all of your user IDs until all the accounts are locked down and none of your users can log in. Another way you can help avoid brute force attacks is to force your users to create unique user IDs in the same way that you force them to create unique passwords. And I'm going to go more into this in a second. And again, never send anything personal from the client. So. You want to make all your user IDs and your passwords contain at least one uppercase character, one lowercase character, one number, potentially one non-alphanumeric character, and make sure that both of these are unique. You do not want the same user ID and passwords. Plus, you most definitely would want to ask a security question that you create. By no means let them create their own security question because very often their security question will be the password itself and that kind of messes up the whole security issue. And also on a regular basis you would want to force them to change their passwords. Another common mistake is telling the person that just failed to log in exactly why. Never tell them that they failed to log in because the user ID was incorrect or because the password because that just makes it that much easier for them to brute force their way in. And if you put a timeout of say 30 minutes or an hour before they are allowed to try to log in again, don't tell them when that timeout period is. Just tell them to try again soon. Remember, cookies can be intercepted by intercepting proxies. If you do create an account activation code, make sure that it is unique and in the previous tutorial we were going over account activation codes and that script believe me will become much more secure as this tutorial was continued. If you use a multi-stage login system which means that they would for example put in a user ID and password and then would be required to enter a pin number and then be required to enter a capture code all on separate pages make sure that you verify they passed on all of the previous stages each time they're asked to re-verify at stage two and stage three. Otherwise, that would allow somebody to jump in and maybe just answer a PIN code number, which would also hurt your security. Also, if you're using a multi-stage login system, you would never want to pass a value such as verified equals true for each point in which they pass the multi-stage system. And also, by no means is it secure, but you should always use POST requests over GET requests in your HTML.
Other common mistakes is storing password information that is easily accessible with session tokens that are stored on the system. And I'm going to get more into session IDs and securing this information. You would always want them to enter their passwords before they would be able to access anything that you would want to secure. So sessions will only store user IDs, nothing else. Your forgotten password scripts must be protected. This is one of the easiest ways to hack into websites. I'm going to get more into that in a second. Also use CAPTCHA systems as much as possible because they are very reliable, not perfect, but very reliable in telling the difference between an automated computer system and a human. Again, never allow users to define their own security questions because why? Very often they enter the password as the question. So how exactly should you secure your forgotten password scripts? Well, if the user does request a new password, you want to send them another random password to their email. Don't send them their original password. Then you want to require them to answer a security question. Remember, the one that you told them. Then you want to require them to create a new password. Of course, use a CAPTCHA system to make sure this isn't an automated system. You want to set a time limit for the use of this script and then shut it down. And then of course you definitely want to log all activity on all of your forgotten password scripts. Again, this is a very often hacked area of your website. And now I'll go through briefly a little bit about other random attacks. You have cross-site scripting attacks. And a cross-site scripting attack is normally whenever a hacker embeds and then executes client-side code that is normally embedded in messages posted on bulletin boards. And normally whenever this code is executed, it can steal cookies, session data, and etc. I mean, I don't get a lot more into cross-site scripting. Basically, how to avoid it is to always validate any information that gets posted to your website. Then you have SQL injection. Again, we went over this in previous PHP security tutorial. Always validate all of the input the user enters. Then you have session hijacking and fixation. Basically, you avoid this by limiting the information that you have stored in your sessions. And then you can also use the session regenerate ID function, which will create a new session when a person does come on to your system. And also it's a good idea to always create secondary verification tokens whenever you are using sessions. And I'm gonna get a lot more into that very soon in this tutorial. Then you have shell attacks, and this is whenever people try to execute shell commands through your code. And basically to avoid this is don't execute shell commands. However, if you are forced to do that, make sure that all user input is first sent through the escape shell arg function, which is provided by PHP. And again, I'll get more into that. And then you have buffer overflows. And basically to avoid them, it's kind of a hard thing to explain in this tutorial. I'll get into it later. But basically to eliminate those, you just want to limit the length of strings that users are able to pass through using the string length function. So look forward to a lot more code in the next presentation. And if you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comment section below. Till next time.